Hi, I'm Tyler Fultz. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry, from engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is to know nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. If you like this video, please give me a like down below, and go ahead and subscribe if you want to see more videos like this. If you didn't like this video, please let me know down in the comments. Always trying to improve. Today we're going to be looking at another Kurz Gazat video called What If We Nuke a City? And I know they've done other videos in the past involving nuclear weapons, but this one is supposed to have a much more serious tone. So viewer discretion is advised. Let's take a look. Playing around with nuclear weapons in videos <laughs> is fun. There's a visceral joy in blowing things up and a horrifying fascination with things like fireballs, shockwaves, and radiation. And while it does help put our destructive power in perspective, it's not the best way of understanding the real impact of a nuclear explosion. This isn't about city stacks of TNT or about how bright an explosion is. Nuclear weapons are about you. So we've partnered with the Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement to explore what would really happen if a nuclear weapon were detonated in a major city today. Not nuclear war, just one explosion. We begin our story in the middle of downtown in a major city. People are going to work, studying for exams, are lost in their thoughts and daily lives. Right here, a nuclear weapon is detonated and time freezes. The first phase of the explosion happens within less than a second. In a millisecond, a ball of plasma hotter than the sun appears and grows in a fireball to more than two kilometers across. That's something to keep in perspective. Um... Nu the nuclear reactions actually happen even faster than that. We're, there's a, even a funny unit called um, shakes. A shake is 100 nanoseconds. So we're still talking many orders of magnitude smaller than a millisecond. And in that time frame, the reaction's already done. The, uh, the fission reaction, and if this is a thermonuclear weapon, the fusion reactions that result from that from the heat from that fission reaction are all completely gone by this point. Now we're dealing with what you're actually going to see on the order of milliseconds. Within this ball, everyone is just gone. Think of water dripped onto a very hot pan. A sizzle, and then there's nothing. Most buildings, cars, trees, tacky sculpt. You can tell with the sombering music, they're going for a more serious tone. ...and people all evaporated. First, the flash, an intense tsunami of light, washes over the city in an instant. If you happen to have your head pointed in the direction of the explosion, it renders you blind for a few hours. The heat of this light produces a thermal pulse, so energetic and hot that it just burns everything as far as 13 kilometers from the detonation site. What this means is that everything in an area of Note that this thermal pulse is faster than the speed of sound. So this happens before the shockwave, before anyone realizes what's going on. 100 square kilometers that is able to burn starts burning. Plastic, wood, fabric, hair, and skin. If you happen to be in reach of the thermal pulse, one moment you're on your way to work, the next moment you're on fire. Now the second phase begins. It happens in a few seconds. Most people will now first notice that something is wrong, but it's already too late for hundreds of thousands. The flash is followed by the shock wave. The heat and radiation of the fireball create a bubble of superheated and supercompressed air around it that's now expanding explosively. Faster than the speed of sound, creating winds stronger than hurricanes and... Now when they say heat and radiation, they're referring to the thermal radiation that comes from the pulse and now you have a fireball. Not to be confused with the ionizing radiation from the isotopes or the fallout from the explosion. Tornadoes. Human infrastructure is no match for its power. Most major buildings within a kilometer of the fireball are just ground up down to their base. Only steel-reinforced concrete is able to partially resist the pressure. 
In the surrounding parks where retirees feed the ducks, trees blackened and smoldering from the heat a second before snap like toothpicks. If you're outside, you get tossed away like a grain of dust in a tornado. The, the wind speed, we're talking several hundreds, even to the order of several thousand miles per hour at this point. So even structures that were designed to resist hurricanes, this is a lot, a lot stronger. Wave weakens as it travels outwards, but still about 175 square kilometers of houses collapse like they're made of cart, trapping tens of thousands of people who didn't have any time to react. Gas stations explode and fires spread throughout the rubble. A mushroom cloud made from the remains of the fireball, dust and ash rises kilometers into the sky in the next few minutes and casts a dark shadow over the ruined city. Note that the mushroom cloud is, again, we're talking about the thermal effects of the explosion and that this is a very powerful high-yield device. The fact that it's nuclear doesn't necessitate a uh, mushroom cloud. If you've seen my videos on, uh, on Fallout game series, you notice they have little micro mushroom clouds for small, low-yield nuclear devices, but nah, it's because this is a big, powerful weapon. This violently pulls in fresh air surrounding the city, destroying more buildings and providing an abundance of oxygen. It depends on the city what happens next. If there's enough fuel, fires may turn into a firestorm that burns the rubble, everybody trapped in it and people trying to flee the devastation. Up to 21 kilometers from the explosion, people just like you rush to their windows to take pictures of the mushroom cloud, unaware that the shockwave is still... Don't do this. <laughs> coming at them, about to shatter their windows and create a blizzard of sharp glass. The third phase begins in the coming hours and days. We're used to the idea that help will come, no matter the disaster. This time is different. A nuclear explosion is like every natural disaster at once. There are hundreds of thousands or millions of people with serious injuries, lacerations, broken bones, serious burns. In the next few minutes and hours, thousands more will die because of these injuries. Countless people are trapped in collapsed buildings like in earthquakes or blinded by the flash, deaf from the blast wave and unable to flee through streets impassable with rubble and debris. They're terrified, confused and don't know what's happened to them or why. Most likely many hospitals have been leveled along with all the other buildings. Same reason why earthquakes are so deadly, people getting trapped under the rubble and while a lot of people did die instantaneously in, in this explosion, there's a lot of people that are gonna die slow, painful deaths on the order of minutes to hours. Ugh. And most medical professionals are either dead or injured along with everyone else. The survivors lucky enough to have been in metro tunnels or standing in the right place to be unburned and unhurt won't have truly escaped harm yet. Depending on the type of weapon, where it explodes, and even the weather, an awful black rain can begin, with radioactive ash and dust descending on the city, covering everything and everyone. The invisible, malicious, silent horror of radiation takes its turn. Every breath carries poison to the lungs of the survivors. Over the coming days, the people who receive the highest doses of radiation exposure will die. There will be no help, not for hours, or maybe even a lot of this, the uh, severity of the radiation, they are right that it, um, it depends a lot on the weather, actually, um, with the, uh, the wind direction, um, the wind speed, as to what areas are affected most by the uh, radioactive fallout from this, uh, from this type of blast. And it does depend. I mean, some nuclear weapons are more radioactive than the others. It can depend on the altitude of detonation, if it's more of an airburst versus one that's detonated on the ground. Um, there's a lot of factors here, but either way, it's, it's a mess and no infrastructure. Nobody's gonna, gonna try to help you in this situation. Civilization doesn't operate when there is a total breakdown of infrastructure. Roads are blocked, train tracks warped, runways cluttered with rubble. No water, no electricity, no communication, no stores to replenish supplies from. Help from surrounding cities will have a hard time entering the disaster zone, and even if they can, the radioactive contamination will make it risky to get too close. After a nuclear attack, you're on your own. So... Not just the radioactive contamination, you got burning buildings, the entire... They mentioned earlier, you can't even really get, get close to it. Um, 
Shifting topics, this is kind of, this is really what killed people in, say, Fukushima. It was the earthquake itself. Forget what happened in... Nobody died as a result to the, uh, what happened at the nuclear facility. It was, when you have an area this destroyed and you don't have, you can't get access to bring in supplies, rescue people, this is, this is the part that's the most, that can be just as deadly, if not more so, as the actual um, nuclear weapon being detonated here as to why you just can't save as many of these people as you, as you could otherwise. By bit, people emerge from the rubble, on foot, contaminated with radioactive fallout, carrying what little they may have left. They are slow, in pain, traumatized, and they all need food, water, and medical treatment fast. And the damage done by a nuclear weapon doesn't end when the fires burn out and the smoke clears. The hospitals in the neighboring cities are under-equipped for a disaster of this scale and overwhelmed with tens or hundreds of thousands. We've all seen what COVID did to, um, did to hospitals. This video actually came out before COVID. It's, uh, it's three years old by uh, Kurtz Gazan. But um, yeah, we've seen firsthand how this would overwhelm cities in the uh, in the surrounding areas and forget just the pers personnel with uh, radiation sickness um, just the uh, all of the burns lacerations injuries from the uh, being left out in the explosion are gonna overwhelm them too if the ones that could even make it out of the uh, <laughs> the city that was attacked of patients with serious injuries. In the weeks, months, and years to come, many of those who survived will succumb to cancers like leukemia. The reason no government wants you to think about all this is because there is no serious humanitarian response possible to it. We talk about people dying of cancers from a radiation dose. Uh, yes, that is one of the ways that can kill you. Um, but there's, there's an even worse method of dying for people that have um, even higher doses than just the ones that'll boost your risk of getting cancer. Um, you basically bleed from the inside out. If you, depending on where you are and where the fallout was, but for the most severe dose, it's probably one of the most horrific ways to die. Nuclear explosion. There's no way to really help the immediate victims of a nuclear attack. This is not a hurricane, wildfire, or earthquake, or nuclear accident. It is all of these things at once, but worse. We'll emphasize that um, the only nuclear accident that really killed people like this was uh, Chernobyl. Um, the Chernobyl accident was so severe, um, they didn't have a containment structure over their reactor building, but um, the helicopters that were bringing in just to try to extinguish the, um, the heat and the fires would actually drop bricks of lead on down, and the lead would vaporize before it hits the ground. That's how hot some of the material was, and that's why you have to always build a proper containment, containment uh, structure and not defeat your reactor safety systems when doing a test, but anyway, the um, that's an interesting way of putting it because you do have the high winds from the hurricanes, uh, the widespread fires from a wildfires, and the rubble and destruction of an earthquake all at once, and. The amount of release you would get from an explosion, since it's a weapon designed to kill people, would be far greater than you would in any nuclear accident, even Chernobyl. It's, it's a mess. No nation on Earth is prepared to deal with it. The world has changed in the past few years, with world leaders again explicitly and publicly threatening each other with nuclear weapons. Keep in mind this came out before the invasion of Ukraine. Many experts think the danger of a nuclear strike is higher than it has been in decades. Governments tell their citizens that it's good that we have nuclear weapons, but it's bad when anyone else gets them. That it's somehow necessary to threaten others with mass destruction to keep us safe. But does this make you feel safe? It only takes a small group of people with power to go crazy or rogue, a small misstep or a simple misunderstanding to unleash a catastrophe of unimaginable proportions. Exploding stuff in videos is fun. Exploding things in real life, 
not so much. There is a solution, though. Eliminating all nuclear weapons and vowing never to build them again. In 2017, almost two-thirds of all the world's countries, supported by hundreds of civil society organizations and the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement, agreed to prohibit and eliminate nuclear weapons. It's not about who has nuclear weapons and who doesn't. The weapons themselves are the problem. They are deeply immoral and an existential threat to all of us. No matter what country you come from, no matter what political side you find yourself on, we need to demand that they disappear forever. This will not happen without pressure. If you want to be part of this pressure, there are things you personally can do too. Visit notonukes.org to learn more about nuclear weapons and what you can do about them. Hmm. Ah, uh, yes, this is the revival of the con this very controversial topic on uh, nuclear weapons. Um, there are a couple of si sides to this, actually. Um, there's the argument that was just presented that they're an existential threat. But there's also the argument that they prevented a more catastrophic war, say, during the Cold War between the U.S. and the Soviet Union and other countries as well, um, with the mutual assured destruction that ironically led to a longer period of peace. That's a, that's a heavy controversial topic. Um, as far as, and I, I've kind of <laughs> run this through in my head a few times. The one challenge though they'd mentioned about no to nuclear weapons and vowing never to build them again, that's one of those things that would be kind of challenging to enforce, I would, I would imagine. And um, everyone would, would just say, you first. <laughs> Because we're not going to get rid of our nuclear weapons to defend against uh, against your nuclear weapons, so that's that's really the challenge there, is it? If you want to if you want to get rid of all uh, all nuclear weapons, also certain countries um, that have nuclear weapons that would likely get overrun by other countries if they didn't would be even less likely to get rid of theirs. So um, I'm not saying it's not a noble or worthwhile goal. I'm just saying that you're going to get a lot of it's gonna a lot of pushback, a lot of challenge between some com countries that feel, for better or for worse, dependent on nuclear weapons for their own survival. <laughs> I think I'll uh, use the rule of cautious editing judgment and stop and stop right there on that controversial topic. Anyways, let me know what you think of the video down in the comments below. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.